Uh, good morning, everyone, and thank you so much for inviting me uh, to give this uh, talk. Um, I've been tasked today to talk about um, the wide field of hand and upper extremity injuries uh, in the musicians. The only thing is then we have to find, like if we do two nights, we got to find, but I guess if you're finding. So just briefly, um, I'm going to touch on a quick introduction and epidemiology of injuries in the musicians and then talk about the special considerations in musicians and uh, what makes this patient group uh, a bit more special to treat uh, and uh, things to consider when um, treating th this group of patients. Um, we'll talk about the assessment uh, of the musician, both from a history and physical exam standpoint. And then we'll touch on some of the um, major pathologies uh, affecting uh, musicians, uh, which will include uh, the various entrapment neuropathies, uh, overuse, strain, and tendinopathies, and a very specific and unique um, pathology called focal dystonia. And then I'll touch briefly on uh, instrument-specific considerations uh, in uh, the various types of instruments because there's a large heterogeneity um, between string versus percussion versus uh, woodwind and brass. So just talk, touch briefly on the epidemiology, the US Bureau of Labor Statistics projects a 4% growth in employment of musicians over the next 10 years, um, which is about 20,000 jobs per year. So um, many of us will end up uh, seeing a musician at some point. Um, currently, um, MSK injuries are reported in about 50 to 76% of professional musicians. Um, and, uh, the University of Texas uh, found that specifically in brass players, the prevalence of MSK injuries was around 60%. So over 50% of musicians at some point in their career uh, will experience a musculoskeletal injury. Um, and really it affects uh, musicians of all ages from the student um, in their uh, elementary and teenage years all the way um, through um, the later decades of life, but has a peak incidence in the third and fourth decades as this correlates to the peak performance um, and expectations and uh, of the professional musician where they are performing more and um, playing at the top of their game. Um, the International Conference of Symphony and Opera Musicians found that 70% um, of women and 52% of men had MSK injuries. And you can see that there is a disproportionate amount of women compared to men who have these MSK injuries and this could be attributed to the smaller anatomy of the hand uh, and decreased uh, intrinsic and extrinsic muscle mass uh, in women, which we'll talk about a little bit later with the various injuries. Um, but most commonly, pianists and string players uh, have a higher rate of hand and wrist injuries uh, compared to the other musical groups. So in terms of performance-related musculoskeletal disorders, or uh, what will be abbreviated as PRMD moving forward, uh, musicians, just like athletes, are prone to these injuries. Um, it affects their career, it affects their potential earning potential, and really, it can re really impact their confidence um, and their ability to perform um, when they sustain these injuries. As such, I do recommend that musicians should be treated and evaluated like athletes. Um, there is, uh, they have high repetition activity, uh, and they have a very busy schedule between their practices, their performances, uh, lessons. Um, additionally, they have very high levels of expectations for performance and technical precision, and the, for, the field is very, very competitive. So any decrease in performance could lead to the musician uh, being cut from uh, the performance, cut from the orchestra or the group. Uh, so they have very high levels of expectations, just like professional athletes do. And minor changes in range of motion, sensation, and even proprioceptive feedback can re really strongly alter uh, the musician's ability to perform. Um, you know, I have taken care of several musicians at this point, uh, even in my short uh, time at Hopkins, and even in patients that have objectively what we would consider perfect range of motion uh, and strength, even small sensational differences uh, and sensory differences uh, do affect their ability to perform and they can really feel it even if objectively they have great range of motion and mobility and strength. However, um, there are special considerations in musicians 
um, that we should take into account when uh, assessing and treating musicians compared to athletes. Um, musicians most specifically have a very repetitive and very non-ergonomic movements over extended periods of time. Um, the various instruments have very complex hand movements with very awkward positioning. If you can imagine uh, holding a violin uh, or a viola for uh, six to eight to 12 hours on, you know, the, you have a very asymmetrical position. Uh, you have a very uh, awkward positioning of the entire body, including the neck, the shoulder, uh, and especially the left upper extremity, which is a more static um, position in uh, high string instruments and a very dynamic right bow hand. Um, so, and that's just one example of just a very awkward non-ergonomic position for uh, musicians. As touched on, there's an asymmetry of posture and weight support. Um, one limb typically sees a little bit more uh, weight and burden than the other. And oftentimes there are asymmetric movements. Additionally, um, there are sudden changes in practice schedules or increase in the need for practice due to upcoming performances, auditions, changes in career. There's various types of repertoire and music where there are some passages that are more slow and some passages that are very intense and very rapid. And there's a wide heterogeneity in technique, um, even though many are taught various uh, techniques for uh, standardized techniques for the different instruments. Uh, musicians tend to take on their own uh, habits and uh, preferences. Um, so not every musician is the same, even if they play the same instrument. Additionally, because of the sensitivity to even small changes and imperceptible changes to the clinician, um, a lot of clinicians will tend to avoid surgery. Um, but uh, the key thing to remember is that if surgery can provide a reasonable outcome and potentially increase uh, and expedite the return to play, as well as prevent uh, future long-term complications, you know, we should not shy away from recommending surgery if it is uh, indicated. Um, some key considerations for surgical incisions are to uh, avoid them in tactile areas, such as the fingertips, uh, the palm, and put them in tension-free zones around the elbow uh, to prevent any kind of contracture and uh, discomfort when playing the instrument. Uh, in 2020, there was an electronic survey demonstrating that really only 42% of respondents who had a musculoskeletal injury were actually provided this diagnosis by a medical professional. And that shows that there is a, that this is multifactorial, uh, why this occurs. Um, there is a potential reluctance to seek medical attention due to the uh, competitive nature of the field where, you know, if they ha have to be diagnosed with um, uh, and be provided uh, rehab or anything where they may have to stop playing uh, or have to miss a performance, this can really impact their career. Um, additionally, there was a common uh, belief that you know, surgeons in general lack the understanding of the particular demands of musicians. Uh, as orthopedic surgeons and MSK providers, you know, we see a lot more athletes than we see musicians. Uh, and you know, that is not lost on the musician. You know, there is a very unique uh, set of characteristics uh, that have to go into the evaluation and treatment of a musician compared to the athlete. Uh, and there was uh, a comment that there's an unfamiliar unfamiliarity of the provider with musicians compared to athletes, uh, which also plays a role into their reluctance to seek care um, for their injury. Uh, classically, uh, the approach to a professional musician um, has been a multidisciplinary approach to care, where it involves uh, the hand or the sports surgeon, uh, the therapist, whether this be hand therapy, occupational therapy, physical therapy, uh, PMNR and sports and non-operative sports medicine, as well as the music teacher, uh, which is the equivalent of a coach in this case. But I also propose that we expand this and include um, a sports psychologist or psychiatrist as I did mention before that um, these injuries can really impact confidence and the ability to return to high level performance, not just from a physical standpoint, but also from a mental health standpoint. And uh, that is a really important factor to consider. So when, when we assess musicians, um, as with all patients, we wanna take a thorough history of present illness or of present injury, um, perform a comprehensive musculoskeletal exam, but additionally perform a uh, playing analysis. 
uh, and we'll go into these shortly. So the history of present injury, the most common primary symptom in the musician is really uh, pain. Um, most patients will come in really only if something is really bothering them. And if it's usually a little bit of stiffness or a little bit of uh, loss of range of motion, musicians will uh, power through that. But when they have limiting pain, um, typically they will come in to seek medical attention. And the provider needs to distinguish between an aching pain, a sharp pain, a burning pain, electrical shooting pains, as these can all uh, provide clues uh, into providing uh, a accurate uh, diagnosis and working on a differential diagnosis. Um, we need to assess for various factors, um, very similar to treating normal patients, but we need to ask very specifically if there's been any changes in conductor or their playing uh, or practice hours if the rehearsal schedule has changed, or if they have many upcoming performances, as these can impact and change the amount of play time and the intensity of play um, as they start sustaining these injuries. Uh, we should assess what kind of treatments were attempted um, just so that uh, not as many uh, therapies are uh, repeated and make sure that we provide adequate conservative management before recommending surgery. Um, we also have to evaluate for relevant medical history as there are underlying conditions such as diabetes, arthritis, uh, inflammatory arthropathies uh, that can play into and contribute to these uh, MSK injuries. And musicians are normal people as well. They have other uh, recreational activities and some musicians even have other jobs. Um, so we also have to assess uh, if they're overdoing things or um, exacerbating their symptoms through other uh, activities as well. In terms of the comprehensive musculoskeletal exam, um, most uh, papers recommend that the musician actually bring in the instrument uh, to the assessment. Um, you know, oftentimes the provider and the, perform the person performing the assessment is not a professional musician or has, does not have much experience with that specific instrument. So seeing, um, the patient hold the instrument, their posture, uh, either standing or sitting, stand height, um, you know, plays a role in this. And that will help uh, the uh, provider perform an actual adequate assessment of the musculoskeletal system in this more awkward and non-ergonomic position. Uh, additionally, uh, you should look for any asymmetries, as I did mention previously, that um, a lot of instruments, especially the string instruments, are uh, very asymmetric in terms of positioning and range of motion and demands on the dominant and non-dominant extremity. Uh, we should compare this to the contralateral extremity, especially if there's any incidence of uh, hyperlaxity uh, or uh, muscle tone asymmetry. Uh, and the big thing is providing an objective measure of strength uh, range of motion and sensation. So uh, assessment with either a, a dynamometer, um, using goniometers for actual range of motion, and performing a two-point discrimination or a, a Sems-Weinstein monofilament assessment uh, to really get a nice objective measure. And this provides a way to objectively follow the patient throughout the treatment process and have actual numbers associated to their care. Um, and then uh, with uh, the various types of pathologies uh, perform the specific provocative maneuvers. <clears throat> For the playing analysis, um, this is where um, the specialized treatment of musicians comes into play. Um, the first thing to look at is uh, our playing habits. So we need to document any recent changes to uh, the repertoire, whether uh, recently when they started having their injury or noticing their symptoms, if the um, repertoire was more intense, uh, more rapid movements, more intense movements, if they had a new uh, instructor um, who is changing their technique, uh, adjusting um, the way they're using the bow or adjusting their grip on the drumsticks, um, we need to assess the playing schedule if there's been any sharp or rapid increases in intensity and frequency of play as well as any uh, technical changes, such as uh, changing any kind of um, shoulder um, uh, pads or chin rests um, or different weights of instruments, um, such as using a wood bow versus a carbon fiber bow. Um, 
the practice schedule is very important as this is where most musicians, uh, this, this is where they spend most of their time with the instrument. And this can lead to a lot of overuse injuries and strain type injuries uh, if there's been a recent increase in practice schedule. And just like uh, with professional athletes, there, these musicians should also have uh, a warm up and cool down routines, stretching, and we need to assess what they're doing, what if they have adequate warming up and cool down uh, processes. Um, the next thing to assess in the musician is their playing posture. Um, we need to assess how they're sitting and uh, how their extremities are being used in various segments such as the slow segments and the fast segments. Um, these take different tolls on the various, uh, either the dominant or the non-dominant hand. Easy and challenging segments, are they really having most of their symptoms when it's the more rapid or more intense challenging segments? Um, technique can also change when the musician is either sitting uh, versus standing, as that can change how they're holding the instrument, how they're shifting their weight, and how they're using the extremity. Additionally, uh, sheet music versus a memorized position, which sounds interesting, they should be playing the same. However, typically musicians are a little bit more dynamic uh, when there is no stand or sheet music in front of them. And it, they're a little bit more static when the sheet music is there. So it's, a, it's important to assess um, whether they're doing a lot via memorization or if there's a stand with sheet music in front of them. And one thing that can help uh, is a video observation. Uh, sometimes it's, too difficult to bring in the instrument um, or you don't have the time to perform the full assessment in uh, either the therapy suite or the clinic. So having a video observation uh, where uh, the musician can perform and do various segments and then be analyzed by the therapist or the provider um, is also uh, very beneficial. So the goal for the treatment of musicians is really to prevent um, any uh, chronic injuries or any injuries that may lead to decreased playing time. Um, so we discussed kind of how to assess the, the cause of injury by evaluating, by having a thorough medical history with specifics for the musicians, as well as a comprehensive musculoskeletal exam. Um, we've assessed their playing posture, we've assessed their playing habits. So now at this point, we really need to incorporate education um, and uh, education of the musician as well as their uh, music teacher to prevent injuries. So uh, modalities such as stretching um, the tight and overused muscles, strengthening any uh, weak and underused muscles. And that's really important because of the asymmetries in posture and playing can lead to a significant imbalance uh, in the various muscle groups, especially the, um, the complementary uh, muscle groups where um, they can have weak uh, back muscles uh, and strong chest muscles uh, or weak shoulder and compensate more with the hand and wrist. Um, it's really important to discuss with the musician how to adequately pace themselves and perform uh, a, uh, a more efficient practice such as shadow play or visualization rather than just brute forcing uh, their repetition through various uh, pieces. Um, we can educate them on playing and positional biomechanics uh, really work on a good warm-up routine as many musicians uh, won't treat themselves as athletes and will not perform adequate uh, warm-up uh, before playing. Um, and then the ergonomic uh, setup for stand height, uh, seat type, um, sitting position, and arm position, all of these when taken together um, can prevent uh, future injuries uh, to the musicians. So the first set of pathologies I want to talk about uh, will be the entrapment neuropathies. Um, the reason why I've included this as the first uh, set is because this is one of the, uh, these two uh, conditions are very common, but can also lead to uh, long-term permanent uh, damage and changes if ignored uh, and inadequately treated. So the first one we'll talk about is uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. So carpal tunnel syndrome uh, is a peripheral, a peripheral compressive neuropathy of the median nerve as it uh, starts in, uh, as it goes from the forearm through the wrist and into the hand. Um, and the point of compression is the transverse carpal ligament. And carpal tunnel syndrome is actually uh, very important and very common in musicians due to the various wrist postures uh, 
uh, that they put themselves in for very prolonged periods of time. So in the landmark uh, study by Gellerman et al. in JBJS in 1981, he measured uh, carpal tunnel pressures in patients with and without carpal tunnel syndrome and documented these in various uh, risk positions. So in a patient with diagnosed carpal tunnel syndrome with the wrist in the neutral position, that patient already has fairly elevated uh, pressures at about 32 millimeters of mercury. With the wrist at 90 degrees of extension, um, that triples to 110 millimeters of mercury. And that's the same scenario when they have excessive wrist flexion. Um, patient had, there was an average of 94 millimeters of mercury for the carpal tunnel pressure. And you compare this to patients that don't have carpal tunnel um, with the wrist in the neutral position, um, the average carpal tunnel pressure was 2.5, uh, which is significantly less than in patients that had uh, a diagnosis of carpal tunnel syndrome in the neutral position. But even with wrist extension and flexion, it only went up to about 30 and 31 respectively, um, which puts you at a pressure where um, you can, where it does cause carpal tunnel syndrome. And if you can, if you think about uh, in, musicians playing their instruments, uh, oftentimes they can have excessive wrist flexion or wrist extension for several hours on end. And this leads to uh, increases in the carpal tunnel pressure and exacerbate the symptoms of uh, and worsen uh, carpal tunnel syndrome and leads to this transient ischemia of the median nerve. And if left uh, untreated um, can lead to permanent median nerve damage and both sensory and motor changes. So <laughs> patients uh, will present with uh, a pretty standard history. And uh, the one thing I wanna make sure everyone understands is that carpal tunnel syndrome is actually not a pain syndrome. You know, if a patient comes in um, and they're telling you that they don't have any numbness or tingling, but they just have pain in their fingers, it's probably not carpal tunnel syndrome. The predominant symptom in carpal tunnel syndrome uh, is numbness uh, and tingling in the median nerve distribution as shown in this picture. And that pr primarily involves the thumb, the index, the middle, and the radial border of the ring finger. Oftentimes, patients will also have and experience nighttime awakenings. And this is really important as at night, the tendency is to rest the wrist in flexion, and that can lead and that does lead to increased in uh, carpal tunnel pressure, leading to ischemia on, of the median nerve. And this could persist for several hours, um, depending on how long you sleep for. Um, additionally, patients will report that symptoms typically are worse with prolonged activity, especially with wrist flexion or uh, extension, such as playing their instrument. And usually it gets better or resolves uh, when they take a break. As carpal tunnel syndrome progresses and worsens, um, patients can start noticing difficulty with fine motor activity, such as picking up small objects, buttoning their shirts. But this is very noticeable in uh, musicians as well, as it requires very uh, fine and precise movements and tactile sensation when hitting the keys or hitting the various uh, chords or uh, notes on the screens. So the physical exam in carpal tunnel syndrome consists of various provocative maneuvers, uh, in addition to a standard assessment of the hand. Uh, the phalanx test is performed with the wrist in maximal flexion, and you hold this uh, for a period of time until the patient starts noticing some numbness or tingling in the median nerve distribution. The reverse phalanx test is the same test, but done in extension, as both flexion and extension do uh, exacerbate symptoms and lead to an increase in carpal tunnel pressure. The Durkin compression test is compression of the median nerve um, at the wrist before it enters uh, the carpal tunnel. Uh, a Tunnel sign is a, uh, a percussion of the median nerve uh, in the same location that you would perform the compression test, and an irritated nerve would lead to a tingling or zinging sensation in the median nerve distribution. The other thing to look for is thenar atrophy. Um, the recurrent motor branch of the median nerve uh, comes usually uh, in most patients after it enters the transverse carpal uh, after it enters the carpal tunnel and distal to transverse carpal ligament. So compression proximally can lead to motor loss, especially of the thenar musculature. Uh, and that's really important to note as that muscle group is responsible for palmar abduction and opposition. And uh, oftentimes when patients do have thenar atrophy, it does indicate more advanced disease 
uh, and potentially something that we cannot restore. Uh, and then the one interesting thing is to assess for pain or paresthesias with resisted finger flexion or repetitive finger flexion. Uh, and this can indicate the, uh, the presence of a concomitant uh, flexor tenosynovitis or flexor tendonitis that is leading to inflammation of the long flexor tendons of the FDP and the FDS. As they are in the carpal tunnel and share the same space with the median nerve, inflammation of the, of the tendon or tendon coating can decrease the total volume uh, for the median nerve as well. And finally, um, you can perform electrodiagnostics uh, for uh, additional diagnosis. And recently, there's been an uptick in the use of ultrasound evaluation for the cross-sectional area of the median nerve, um, but that's still being uh, studied right now. So the treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome uh, starts off with non-operative treatment. And typically, my recommendation and the general recommendation is six to eight weeks of nighttime splinting. And this can be either a prefabricated um, cock-up wrist brace or a custom thermoplastic splint if a prefabricated brace uh, doesn't fit or doesn't fit well for the patient. And fit is really important for this because that really will increase your compliance as if it's not comfortable to wear or it's too uncomfortable to sleep in, patients won't wear it. And that defeats the purpose of uh, prescribing one. The, the goal of nighttime splinting is to position the wrist in a neutral and a very slight extension of the wrist uh, where uh, you have the lowest amount of uh, pressure within the carpal tunnel, thus giving the median nerve um, a, essentially a break uh, as uh, the patient is sleeping and taking tension and pressure off of the nerve during that time. Um, the next thing to consider is potentially a uh, corticosteroid injection. Um, and uh, that has been shown to be effective, uh, but not a permanent solution in many patients. However, uh, typically and classically young females do tend to respond to cortisone injections with nighttime splinting quite well and can have significant and permanent decreases in symptoms. Um, my preferred technique for cortisone injection is actually to perform them under ultrasound guidance. Uh, and the reason for that um, is even though typically the median nerve uh, lies in the radial position uh, in the carpal tunnel, there are variations in its position. Uh, and um, Iatrogenic, um, sorry. Uh, iatrogenic uh, injury to the median nerve has been described, and even just poking the median nerve with a 25 gauge needle uh, can lead to median neuritis, uh, which uh, is really uh, bothersome to the patient. So, when you perform this under ultrasound guidance, you get very clear visualization of the flexor tendons and the median nerve, and can really guide the needle in a, in a place where you will not. Um, hit the median nerve at all, um, and especially in, in musicians who are very sensitive to these uh, sensory changes and uh, shooting pain and tingling, you really don't want to give them a median neuritis when you're injecting them. Uh, oral anti-inflammatories have been described uh, as potential uh, uses in carpal tunnel syndrome, um, either an oral NSAID or a medrol dose pack. Um, the, well, the AOS has mixed recommendations for uh, um, medial dose pack and really don't recommend oral NSAIDs for the treatment of carpal tunnel itself. However, if the patient also has flexor tendonitis or flexor tenosynovitis, it's not unreasonable to consider an oral NSAID. And then hand therapy is very mixed uh, in the literature um, in terms of the effectiveness of hand therapy with uh, the treatment of uh, carpal tunnel syndrome. There's various median nerve glides, flexor tendon glides. Um, and Typically, um, I will send a patient for hand therapy if they're demonstrating any kind of weakness, any kind of loss of range of motion, uh, any uh, abnormalities in hand motion. Um, and especially in, in musicians who are very sensitive to this, uh, I do think that a short course of hand therapy is potentially beneficial. Uh, even just one session with a the hand therapist to learn how to perform the stretching exercises, the strengthening exercises, the intrinsic strengthening exercises is beneficial. Uh, but the AOS has uh, limited guidelines for this. And then the operative treatment of carpal tunnel syndrome can either be open, which is the standard carpal tunnel release, or an endoscopic carpal tunnel release. Um, and specifically in the musician, I'm going to talk about why I do think endoscopic is the superior option. 
so this is from the uh, clinical practice guideline published by the AOS in terms of non-operative treatment of um, carpal tunnel syndrome. And uh, the, the, two, the, the two modalities that have the strongest recommendations are the splinting, which makes sense as it treats the biomechanical problem of the uh, increased pressure in uh, wrist flexion and wrist extension. And the other one is actually cortisone injection, as it has been shown to improve patient reported outcomes, um, definitely in the short term and um, a little bit mixed in the long term. Um, as you can see here, ultrasound uh, for therapy uh, and acupuncture have very limited uh, recommendations by the Academy of Orthopedic Surgeons. So the open carpal tunnel release um, is done with a standard uh, two to three to four centimeter incision in the palm. Uh, most people perform what we call a mini open technique now and re very rarely cross the wrist crease. Um, so it's not a very invasive procedure at all. Um, but, um, you know, if you feel the skin on your palm compared to the skin in your distal forearm along the volar aspect, the skin of the palm is very different than the forearm skin. And the, the glabrous skin of the palm is very thick. Uh, it's very sensitive. Um, and it's not as uh, malleable and stretchy as the skin in kind of the forearm. And this is where I do think the advantage of an endoscopic carpal tunnel release comes in, um, in especially in musicians and people who are very sensitive to uh, changes in sensation, changes in motion and potential scarring um, in the hand. So the endoscopic technique actually places a one centimeter transverse incision right along one of the distal wrist flexion creases. So it actually does not go into the palm at all. Um, and the uh, the endoscope is advanced uh, into, the into the carpal tunnel and hugs the undersurface of the transverse carpal ligament. Um, so in this slide, you'll see a uh, schematic uh, kind of showing what it looks like on the outside, but the bottom pictures are actually images um, from a recent patient I, I just did. Um, so if you take a look at the first picture, you'll see that the scope is looking straight up, and that is showing the transverse crossing fibers of the transverse carpal ligament. And distally in the view, you can see a little bit what we call the sentinel fat. And that demonstrates that you're at the end of the uh, carpal tunnel or at the end of the transverse carpal ligament. And the second picture shows the initial cut. And as you can see, there is muscle on top of the transverse carpal ligament. Um, you have the hypothenars and the thenar musculature that oftentimes when you perform an open technique, you have to either divide, you have to, you have to push away um, and sometimes cut this muscle. Um, whereas in the endoscopic technique, as I can show you in the third picture here, um, you can get a complete division of the transverse carpal ligament and leave the muscle completely intact. Um, and this really uh, has major implications, especially for, for my manual laborers uh, or anybody who wants to return to work, but this, in musicians especially, I think is very beneficial as uh, the uh, recovery for this is a little bit quicker. Now, the, the nuances of open versus endoscopic carpal tunnel release are a little bit uh, too much for this talk as you can spend a whole hour talking about one versus the other. Um, but overall, um, the outcomes at one year of open versus endoscopic carpal tunnel release are the same. So there's not one technique that's better or worse than the other in the long term. Um, but in the short term, um, endoscopic carpal tunnel release has been shown to return patients to work much faster. And anecdotally, uh, patients are much happier with a smaller incision in the distal forearm where the skin heals a little bit better, the skin is a little bit more mobile, um, and you get a little bit less hypersensitivity than having a scar in the palm itself. Um, typically patients uh, after this uh, procedure with me don't get any splints uh, or braces. They actually leave surgery that day with a Band-Aid um, and are allowed to begin immediate finger range of motion. Um, but in musicians, uh, this is the one patient group where I actually do not let them return to full play as um, especially in string instruments due to the excessive wrist flexion um, there's a potential for uh, subluxation of the flexor tendons. So in string musicians or any instruments where uh, patients do have excessive wrist flexion, I do uh, recommend two weeks of rest 
uh, from playing and working only on range of motion of the wrist and fingers. So the next one to talk about is cubital tunnel syndrome, which is a uh, peripheral uh, neuropathy at the medial elbow. And this is a combination of both compression and traction on the ulnar nerve uh, at the medial elbow. And typically patients with cubital tunnel syndrome will come in with more advanced uh, disease uh, than um, carpal tunnel syndrome. As um, a lot of people really have cubital tunnel syndrome, if you keep your elbows flexed for any period of time or you're on your cell phone for a while, if you get any numbness or tingling in the small finger or the ulnar nerve distribution, you have a hint of cubital. And oftentimes if they extend their elbow, shake it out, do a little bit of stretching, it goes away. So this gets ignored a lot more than carpal tunnel syndrome. When the elbow is flexed, the cross-sectional area of the cubital tunnel decreases by just under half, which is a lot. So you get a lot of pressure and compression of the ulnar nerve, but also due to the, due to the wide arc of motion of the elbow, you also get a um, traction uh, injury of the ulnar nerve where it has a 2.2 centimeter total um, excursion through the arc of motion, and that can lead to a stretch injury as it is tethered over the medial epicondyle in uh, the cubital tunnel itself. The cubital tunnel has multiple points of compression, unlike carpal tunnel syndrome, where it's typically just a transverse carpal ligament. The most common location is Osborne's ligament at the cubital tunnel, um, and but you can get it anywhere along the course of the ulnar nerve. And then there's an anomalous muscle called the Anconeus epitrochlearis, but that's a pretty rare phenomenon. Patients will describe numbness and tingling, very similar to carpal tunnel syndrome, but rather typically in the small finger. Um, whereas carpal tunnel syndrome really doesn't cause any symptoms in the small finger. And symptoms are exacerbated with prolonged elbow flexion. And things to look for on physical exam, uh, especially are a first dorsal interosseous atrophy. Uh, and that does demonstrate more significant disease. But more, also more importantly, uh, evaluation for subluxation of the ulnar nerve or the medial epicondyle. And this is really important in the right arm of uh, string players as uh, the right elbow in violin, uh, viola, cello, and bass players really goes through a significant arc of motion uh, very rapidly, especially in uh, rapid and intense segments. And if they have subluxation of the ulnar nerve every time they maximally flex the elbow, this could lead to a, uh, a tenels like shock down the ulnar nerve. Um, and this typically does necessitate uh, surgical management. Uh, but the the assessment of cubital tunnel syndrome from a sensory and a motor standpoint is very similar uh, to carpal tunnel syndrome with the provocative, uh, with other signs to look for, which are Wartenberg sign, which is uh, inadvert, involuntary abduction of the small finger and the inability to adduct uh, back to the ring finger, as well as Froment sign, which is uh, where they're unable to uh, perform adduction of the thumb and have to compensate by flexing the thumb IP joint. Uh, electrodiagnostics are also used in uh, cubital tunnel syndrome, and typically if patients have under, uh, uh, have a conduction velocity across the elbow under 50, um, that is consistent with cubital tunnel. Cubital tunnel's non initial non-operative treatment is with elbow extension bracing. Um, you can do activity modification where you minimize the amount of elbow flexion uh, required uh, and some therapy for ulnar nerve glides, flexor point or strengthening. Um, and operative treatment varies um, uh, and is very hotly debated into what is uh, the preferred technique, but this, is, this varies greatly between every hand surgeon. Uh, you can perform an inside to cubital tunnel release, which addresses the pressure by releasing uh, the point of compression, but it keeps it in the cubital tunnel. Um, you can perform a cubital tunnel release with a subcutaneous anterior transposition with various flaps or fat uh, pad transfers. Um, and this is actually my preferred technique in musicians. And the reason for that is the the other option is a submuscular transposition where you actually have to cut into the flexor pronator mass, uh, perform essentially a flexor pronator lengthening and bury the nerve inside the muscle. And that uh, can lead to fatigue and cramping and pain of the flexor pronator muscles for an extended period of time. And it has a much longer rehabilitation period. However, in patients with uh, significant medial epicondylitis, that doesn't get better with non-operative treatment. Uh, submuscular anterior transposition is uh, the treatment of choice. So now we'll talk very briefly and quickly on overuse injuries, strain injuries, and tendinopathies. Um, these are typically uh, uh, can be treated without surgery, and they do not typically have long-term uh, 
um, chronic issues uh, once they are treated. So overuse syndrome is actually pretty ill-defined, but this is the most common musculoskeletal injuries in musicians. Uh, and over 50% of musicians reported some form of overuse of the upper extremities with pain uh, and fatigue. And this is described, this is uh, defined as the culmination of playing past the point of muscle fatigue. And there are many risk factors for this, including constant repetition, disproportion between the musician and the instrument. So the smaller the patient is compared to the size of the instrument, the higher the rate of overuse, poor posture, excessive finger angulation, a recent increase in playing time, and once again, female gender, likely due to the decreased muscle mass and hand size. Um, the, the, the pathophysiology uh, has been uh, evaluated, but uh, we haven't had any clear cut um, uh, definitions for why exactly this happens. Um, this typically occurs in the forearm and the hand. Uh, patients have usually a vague sensation of weakness, loss of dexterity, some stiffness, just the hand and the arms just not moving as well as it should. They can't keep up with their performance or their practice schedule. And on physical exam, unlike other symptom, other syndromes, this doesn't really have any distinct tenderness to palpation. It's usually a more vague um, description of the symptoms. And patients will usually have full range of motion and full strength when you're assessing them because this typically happens when they're playing. There's two phases uh, described for overuse syndrome. The first one is the acute phase, and this is where um, patients are recommended to rest. Uh, and uh, typically we recommend for, for patients with severe overuse syndrome, it has been recommended for up to three months of rest and activity modifications, as well as working on ergonomic modifications. Um, but once they get they get improvement with rest, uh, they can begin the rehabilitation phase uh, where there's focus on conditioning uh, with aerobic and anaerobic exercises, uh, focus on posture with kind of with paras uh, scapular strengthening, scapular thoracic strengthening, especially in the instruments that require uh, proximal upper extremity muscle strength, such as using the deltoids and the rotator cuffs. Patients usually have disproportionate strength between their chest muscles and the uh, scapular thoracic muscles. And then we work on a graduated return to play schedule. Uh, but the data suggests that this really doesn't become a chronic condition once it is appropriately treated and uh, the musician can work on prevention. The next one to talk about is lateral epicondylitis. And this is a big one I wanna talk about because it's very um, uh, misunderstood. Um, and it's in the name. Uh, the problem is you see the itis and you infer that this is an inflammatory condition um, but it's not actually an inflammatory condition. Uh, the histolo histology studies have demonstrated that this is a non-inflammatory angiofibroblastic tendinosis of the ECRB and sometimes the EDC tendon origins at the lateral epicondyle with mucoid degeneration of the uh, origin. So this is really not an inflammation of the extensor origin. Um, and this is due to the this area being a high strain uh, environment. Uh, and typically the extensor origin is responsible for wrist extension and finger extension. However, if you make a fist and you're gripping things to stabilize the wrist, you actually have to fire the extensors and maintain uh, contraction of the extensor. So uh, the extensor origin, uh, the ECRB and the EDC really see a lot of use, which is why they're very commonly uh, strained and injured. Um, patients will report lateral elbow pain exacerbated by activities, particularly in elbow extension. Because the origin starts on the proximal aspect of the elbow on the humerus, uh, when you extend the elbow, it actually increases the length and tension on the um, extensor origin and the EDC and the ECRV. Uh, and that's why patients will typically experience more symptoms with the elbow extended than with the elbow uh, flexed. Um, the, this is a clinical diagnosis. Um, you really don't need imaging uh, to make this diagnosis and patients will typically have distinct point tenderness right on the lateral epicondyle or on the extensor origin um, and have pain with resisted wrist extension, typically worse when you assess them with the elbow extended than with the elbow flexed. Um, you can get an MRI to evaluate any kind of intra-articular pathology, concomitant synovitis, a potential radio capitellar plica, um, but really in patients that have a pretty classic history and physical exam, I do not get any advanced imaging. Um, 
And really the treatment for lateral epicondylitis is non, typically non-operative. Overall, 80% of the patients will notice significant symptomatic improvement by one year. Some patients will have some mild residual symptoms and flare-ups. Um, and it starts off as with any kind of overuse and strain type injury with rest, anti-inflammatories and activity modifications. But you'll be, you're, you're asking me why recommend anti-inflammatories if this is a non-inflammatory condition. It's debatable, um, but this can reduce um, some surrounding infl inflammation, such as intraarticular synovitis or surrounding muscle strain. Um, so NSAIDs can provide some symptomatic relief uh, for the inflam inflammation and inflammatory process around uh, the lateral epicondyle, but not for the pathology itself. Um, activity modifications are really important, uh, and typically I will counsel patients to perform more of their activities of daily living with elbow flexion rather than extension. Um, orthoses have been found to be helpful, especially the counterforce brace, which is a strap along the proximal forearm right over the uh, extensor muscle belly, not on the lateral epicondyle. And what this does is it essentially creates a new origin to offload and decrease the stress on the actual extensor origin. Um, and some patients can find this helpful. Uh, the mainstay of treatment really has been physical therapy, and there are so many variations, techniques, and modalities for lateral epicondylitis, um, depending on the therapist. But typically, it's a combination of modalities as well as extensor stretch stretching and strengthening. And there's been a recent uptick in the use of eccentric muscle strengthening, focusing on muscle hypertrophy and reducing, which reduces strain on the tendon itself. And there's been some studies that eccentric muscle strengthening does increase collagen formation and decrease the neovascularization that can lead to pain seen in lateral epicondylitis. Now, talking about corticosteroid injections for this, um, I have a lot of patients that come in and just asking for a cortisone injection. Um, and they've, in, the, in a randomized controlled trial uh, in 2005, um, the, yes, uh, cortisone injection for the very short period of time does lead to uh, significant improvement in pain. But in a Lancet article in 2002, they found that between 12 weeks to 12 months, patients that had an injection really didn't fare that much better. And some actually did worse um, compared to the other treatment groups. And a course of injection is not risk-free. Uh, you can get uh, permanent skin hypopigmentation, but more importantly, um, this can lead to fat atrophy right at the lateral epicondyle, which makes surgery a little bit more complicated as it increases scarring and wound complications um, uh, should the patient require surgery. And uh, from a histologic standpoint, a uh, course of injection uh, has been shown to decrease collagen production and uh, tenocyte replication. In terms of operative treatment of lateral epicondylitis, this is pretty rare, um, but um, there's two ways of doing it. You can do an open extensor debridement and lateral epicondylectomy, or you can do an arthroscopic version of this. Uh, overall, studies have shown no uh, out, no, no, not one is not better than the other, and that overall outcomes are about the same between the surgical techniques. Um, and in the original paper described by Nerschel, 85% um, of patients were able to get back to all activity. So it works well. Um, but this is not the first line of treatment. Uh, lateral epicondylitis is really uh, can be treated non-operatively for an extended period of time, and the patient should be counseled that this will take a long time to get better. Uh, the next one we'll talk about is the Quervain's tenosynovitis, and this is a stenosing tenosynovitis of the first dorsal compartment, um, and this typically causes radial sided wrist pain with activities requiring ulnar deviation. And once again, the bow hand of a, a high string in, um, uh, instrument such as the violin um, will really exacerbate the Quervain's tenosynovitis as it does create a significant amount of ulnar deviation. Um, and there are many anatomic variations uh, of the furcosal compartment, which leads to um, sometimes a poor response to non-operative treatment as there has been found to be a subsheath within the first social compartment, which essentially separates the first social compartment into two compartments where the APL and the EPB are in their own compartments. And that septation leads to um, a poor response to non-operative treatment. The main technique for this is, uh, the main uh, physical exam findings are tenor palpation over the first social compartment uh, and the Finkelstein's maneuver, which is shown in this picture, which is uh, having the patient grasp their thumb and performing an ulnar deviated uh, maneuver which stretches and stresses the uh, first dose compartment tendons. Uh, no uh, imaging is required. 
So the, the first line of treatment for the quare veins, if it's more mild, is actually thumb spica splinting with uh, some sort of an NSAID, such as topical or oral NSAIDs with rest. And if it's more mild, this will usually get a little bit better. However, um, if it does persist, uh, my first line of treatment for this is corticosteroid injection. And the corticosteroid injection works really well as this is an inflammation of the tenosynovium. So reducing inflammation will improve uh, the glide through the essential retinaculum and reduce the pain and symptoms associated with the Quervin's tenosynovitis. Um, but in patients that have the anatomic variation, um, they typically don't respond well because it's a structural problem where they have a separate compartment which leads to a space problem, not an, infl not an inflammation problem. And typically these patients uh, typic, uh, will progress to uh, surgical management, which is a first dose of compartment release. This surgery works really well, uh, has a cure rate of 91%. Um, they're really only immobilized for two weeks at a thumb spike is split and most return to normal activities at two weeks post-op. Uh, the last of the strain type injuries I want to discuss is trigger finger, and this is a stenosing tenosynovitis uh, of the flexor tendons as they transition from the palm to the fingers. And uh, this is due to a uh, stenosis of the A1 pulley um, over the FDS and FDP tendons. Um, the major risk factors for these are diabetes, but also mechanical irritation of the interface. And you okay. see this a lot in you see this a lot in patients who have to perform a lot of finger flexion activities, such as pianists, uh, and the left hand of uh, high string and low string instruments. Uh, and typically, patients will report pain with gripping and repetitive finger range of motion. They'll notice a catching or clicking sensation, and sometimes a locking sensation of the digit where they can't extend the digit. And in, in more mild cases, even if they don't have mechanical symptoms, they may notice a stiffness and slowing of the digit with pain directly over the A1 pulley. There's four uh, really uh, grades of trigger finger, and this is all done on the physical exam. Grade one is just tenderness palpation over the A1 pulley with some history of catching. Grade two is the patient being able to show you active catching um, in the office. Grade three is when they're uh, locking inflection requiring passive extension with the contralateral hand. And grade four is when they're, uh, they have a fl fixed flexion contractor at the PIP joint and even passive extension does not unlock the digit. Treatment for this uh, is controversial as uh, splinting versus cortisone injection um, depends on the practitioner. Um, some people recommend nighttime PIP splinting for about six weeks. Uh, and that just leads to prevention of the flexed position um, it has been shown to have mixed effectiveness. A cortisone injection, it works really well. And this is where in musicians, I will lean a little bit more heavily towards cortisone injections. Um, typically, I provide one to two cortisone injections before recommending surgery, as the data shows that the first two injections have the highest rate of success. Um, but there is still a over 50% success rate with the third injection. But once you reach the fourth injection, uh, it drops to about 30%. Um, but the reason why um, I do recommend this, and I will perform more cortisone injections for trigger fingers in musicians, is that the surgery, the most common complication is stiffness, um, because you are putting an incision right over um, the A1 pulley and the tendon. You know, if they develop scar tissue, um, this can lead to hypersensitivity as well as some stiffness at the digit and leads to slowing uh, and perception of decreased mobility at the digit. And that really affects performance and playing and oftentimes will require extensive therapy. Um, I, I perform these under a wide awake uh, local anesthesia so the patient is completely awake and can actually participate in the surgery. And this is uh, particularly useful in patients that have locking where uh, they can actually show me if they still lock in surgery. And it's a great way of checking your work and making sure that both you and the patient are comfortable with the release that was performed. And the last um, pathology I want to talk about is very specific for musicians, uh, and this is focal dystonia. Um, and uh, this is uh, Leon Fleischer, uh, one of uh, the great American pianists, uh, who actually had this problem early on and really affected his career. But this is essentially the same. This is the musician's cramp or the analogy, an analogous uh, pathology to a writer's cramp. But it's a painless disorder of uh, motor control result, resulting in sustained muscle contraction that is involuntary, and it leads to twisting and abnormal posturing and loss of control of the hand. Um, we don't really know why and how this occurs, but there is a correlation between the muscle groups that are involved 
in the repetitive motor activity as well as the muscle groups that then become dystonic. Um, and symptoms almost exclusively begin when playing the instrument. And this is really uh, limiting for the musician and sometimes career ending. Uh, the treatment for this is um, uh, still being investigated, um, but there's talk about technical retraining um, and potential use of Botox injections or anticholinergics. And uh, from a neurosurgical standpoint, uh, potentially deep brain stimulation. But the key thing is, this is not carpal tunnel syndrome. So these patients should not get a carpal tunnel release. Um, you know, this is a uh, non-painful, but doesn't cause any sensory issues. There's no numbness or tingling. This is a loss of motor muscle control with a abnormal posturing. So this is not a condition that should be sent to a hand surgeon. This is something that should be seen by neurology, uh, physiatry, and potentially neurosurgery. So now that we talked about the, the common uh, nerve entrapment, neuropath the entrapment neuropathies, the overuse injuries, and focal dystonia, let's talk a little bit about the biomechanics of uh, specific instruments. Um, so the first one is piano. Uh, the piano is a very symmetric instrument. Patients are usually um, seeing similar stresses between the left and the right hand. Um, the elbow is flexed at about 90 degrees, and patients have their wrists in neutral with slight ulnar deviation with a fully pronated forearm. Um, the key thing on piano is patients will have a lot of small finger abduction as they try to hit various octaves and chords, um, and they have repetitive MCP and PIP flexion and extension. Um, small hand size has been shown to be an independent risk factor for musculoskeletal injuries and strain type injuries due to repetitive excessive attempts at small finger abduction and patients will then use uh, various wrist movements to try to compensate for this, which can lead to injury. Um, in a study in 2002, um, pianists were more frequently reported to have intrinsic hand muscle strain, as well as extrinsic flexors and extensor strains due to the repetitive nature of finger flexion and extension, as well as the need to perform uh, abduction of both the thumb and the small finger, as well as the central digits as well. Um, typically, they will have intrinsic hand contractors and cramps, um, they have a higher rate of trigger finger than the other instruments, and they're, uh, as with all musicians, uh, more prone to overuse disorders. So a lot of this is going to be with stretch, a treatment of a pianist will be with stretching and training uh, the hand intrinsics and strengthening the hand intrinsics, while also working on improving the abduction of the thumb and small finger uh, to prevent uh, these kinds of injuries. Um, I've separated the string instruments into high string and low string instruments, uh, the high string instruments being the violin and the viola. Um, these are actually very similar instruments, except for the fact that the viola is a little bit bigger, a little heavier, um, but technically quite similar. Um, and this is where I actually see a lot of uh, upper extremity injuries. Uh, and this is really due to the very awkward, non-ergonomic asymmetric positioning of a violinist. The picture on the right is Joshua Bell. Uh, and as you can see, there's a the right hand and the left hand look completely different and they are put in positions that are really non-anatomic and put a lot of stress on both the left and the right hand, but they see different kinds of stress. Additionally, due to holding the instrument between uh, the chin and the clavicle, um, violinists and uh, violists also have a high prevalence of neck and shoulder injuries and strain in addition to hand and wrist strain. And interestingly, you would think that these musicians would have higher intrinsic hand strength due to using their fingers a lot more. However, um, a study by Gornick demonstrated that uh, non-musicians actually had higher grip strength uh, than a violinist. And this was attributed to overuse of the hand intrinsics and the extrinsic flexors leading to weakness uh, during the assessment. So, for high string instruments, you should also have a special consideration for the individualized chin rest, which is where they rest uh, the instrument on their chin. Um, and there are various heights and sizes for this, as well as the shoulder rest size and position, uh, depending on their neck length to prevent uh, excessive uh, neck rotation and flexion. Um, and the, one, the other thing though is therapy for the hands um, between the dominant and non-dominant hand should be specialized for the task. Oftentimes when we treat patients, um, we treat them the same for both the non-dominant and the dominant hand. However, in high string instruments, the dominant hand and the non-dominant hand do very different things. And 
Uh, as you can see in the picture on the far right, uh, the left hand in uh, violinists and violists uh, typically is positioned in uh, 90 degrees of the 100 degrees of elbow flexion with oftentimes excessive wrist flexion um, and um, finger uh, flexion. And this is important because typically uh, when uh, the wrist is flexed, it's actually harder to flex the digits as there's an imbalance between the long extrinsic and the long flexors. So therapy for the left hand should really be focused on this position to improve tendon excursion and range of motion in this position. Whereas on the right hand, which is the bowing hand, patients have much more dynamic wrist range of motion um, and gripping um, and the therapy and rehabilitation for the right hand um, should be focused on uh, improving the fluidity and mobility of the bow hand. So a little bit of a special consideration for uh, the string instruments for the therapy side. Cello and bass uh, are a little bit different than violinist, uh, from, uh, than violin and viola due to the fact that they're a little bit more symmetric. Uh, as you can see, Yo-Yo Ma holding um, uh, his cello and playing, you can see that typically the shoulder posture is a little bit more symmetric. The elbow position is a little bit more symmetric. Um, but this is, you also have to make sure that the, pay, that the musician has adequate sitting posture and ergonomics as uh, this instrument is a lot bigger uh, and much heavier. Um, the other thing though is this can, this uh, specific low string type instrument, so the cello and the bass um, requires a lot of left shoulder abduction. Uh, and in patients who develop muscle fatigue of the shoulder muscles, what will happen is they will drop the arm down and compensate by performing uh, excessive wrist flexion and thumb hyperextension to compensate for the poor positioning due to shoulder fatigue. Um, and this can uh, lead to the postural neuropathies and tendinopathies. And the other thing to note is that uh, these strings are much thicker than the violin and uh, the viola, and that this can lead to more um, uh, uh, pain and uh, deficits in the fingertips. Percussion is a completely different field and very uh, heterog uh, heterogeneous with a wide range of instruments, styles, and techniques. There's a lot of forceful striking with either mallets, the drumsticks, or even bare hands, which can increase the risk of tenus synovitis, overuse, and lateral epicondylitis due to the constant striking. And the force is transmitted uh, through the drumstick um, or the mallet directly into the palm over the transverse carpal ligament in the carpal tunnel, very similar to almost like a jackhammer, and these patients can develop carpal tunnel syndrome. Additionally, um, they have excessive ulnar deviation as every time they strike um, the drums or the timpani, they have a lot of ulnar deviation, and this can exacerbate ulnar set of wrist pain. So typically the recommendation is some sort of an orthosis or athletic taping of the wrist to prevent excessive ulnar deviation, to prevent this ulnar sided wrist pain, as well as grip uh, weight and style adjustment um, to see uh, if we can reduce any kind of these injuries. Um, and finally, I want to talk about woods, woodwinds and, and brass. And I love these together, uh, but really they're very different as they're varying sizes and weights. Um, as you can see, the, the flute is very light and small, and you get all the way to the tuba, which is very large, and the positioning is very different, the posture is very different. Um, so the weight of the instrument does contribute to the incidence of musculoskeletal injuries. Um, as poor posture and muscle fatigue uh, are ex uh, ex expedited with a, a heavier instrument. So something to, to be careful about. But overall, in woodwinds and brass, there is a lower rate of musculoskeletal injuries compared to pianists and string players. There's been many hypotheses in this, a more central posture, and the fact that practice times are actually not just limited by the extremities, but also limited by uh, lung capacity and um, uh, uh, mouth and lip fatigue. Uh, so typically they will take more breaks uh, than string players. Additionally, uh, various harnesses and straps can be used to transfer the weight away from the fingers and hand and wrist to the shoulder and the upper back, which can take some of the load off of the uh, hand and wrist. And uh, stand supports and various posts, especially for the heavier instruments can be used to really offload uh, for these instruments. So as you can see, there's a, a wide variety in the different types of instruments and techniques and styles. But the one thing that is pretty uniform across all instruments and all musicians 
is the recommendation for a uh, graduated return to play after musculoskeletal injury. And this allows the uh, musician to gradually return um, in a effective and safe manner and eventually get them back to full level of play. But as you can see, it takes a really long time um, before uh, they're able to return to full play. And these are two different kind of schedules um, uh, in the literature for a graduated return to play schedule. Um, and uh, this takes a while. And this is really important because this does affect the livelihood and the ability for these musicians to return to performance level play, to meet the demands of their gig or their symphonic orchestra. Um, so this has to be taken into consideration and the patient really needs to be counseled on the length of time it takes. Um, and this is very similar to a graduated return to play protocol in uh, professional athletes. So overall, um, I know I went through a lot, but musicians just like athletes are prone to musculoskeletal injuries due to the demands of the instruments, their um, expectations and their schedules. Um, you should perform a comprehensive assessment with the instrument as it does help the provider get a better sense as to uh, how they're holding it, when they're having symptoms, when they're having the pain. Uh, and musicians uh, will always be in these prolonged, awkward, non-ergonomic postures and positions. So the goal of rehabilitation will be to strengthen and work on these muscle groups and tendons in those postures to maximize um, their ability to return to play. And the one thing is no violinist or uh, musician plays the instrument the exact same. So the rehabilitation needs to be tailored to the individual depending on their technique. Uh, and that is also really important. And lastly, surgery is an option if conservative management fails. But once again, musicians are very sensitive to even small changes in the hand and finger mobility. So my typical recommendation for musicians um, is to perform minimally invasive surgery as much as possible with careful incision planning, putting the incisions in places where their patients are really not gonna feel it much. It's not on any tactile surface. It's not a, on any major uh, um, portion of the joint where they're gonna feel any stiffness and get them back with a uh, graduated return to play protocol. So these are my references. And at this point I can take uh, any questions or comments. No, sorry, was incredible. I want to thank you for a uh, very comprehensive review of this. And uh, I can see why you kept sports out of it. Uh, this is exhaustive uh, uh, review of the musician. But um, for people that need to get to working, uh, sign off. But uh, Duke is, uh, if he wants to stick around for a couple of questions, that'd be great. Thank you, Duke. Of course. Thank you for having me. Duke, thank you for the excellent presentation. Very informative. I uh, wanted to ask you. Um, about uh, your opinion on prevalence of uh, chronic exertion compartment syndrome in musicians. This is something that's underrecognized. Uh, I feel sometimes some musicians will present with these vague symptoms of pain, paresthesia, uh, of a sub subjective swelling in their upper extremities. And it's usually when they're performing, after they perform, it uh, eases up a little bit. And it's sometimes very difficult to pinpoint a specific nerve distribution. Uh, occasionally I'll say it's PI syndrome. Sometimes it's a lot more vague than that. Uh, what's your opinion on this? Uh, I just want to make sure I understood you correctly. You're asking about exertional compartment syndrome of the upper extremity in musicians, right? Correct, yeah. Yeah, chronic exertional compartment syndrome of the upper extremity is, is, is pretty interesting. Um, it's not as well documented and categorized as the lower extremity exertional compartment syndromes. And uh, in the cases that I've seen and read about in the literature, um, you know, there's a lot of overlap with uh, that overuse syndrome. Um, and it's a, it's a pretty hard diagnosis to make. Um, so it's, it, that's a tricky one uh, because it presents with very similar symptoms of fatigue, cramping, uh, kind of a vague non-dermatomal, uh, you know, pain and uh, neur neurologic symptoms. Um, so for me, uh, exertional compartment syndrome of the, of the upper extremities is really a diagnosis of exclusion when I've ruled out other issues like lateral epicondylitis, uh, radial tunnel syndrome, like you mentioned, potentially Wartenberg syndrome, intersection syndrome, these things where there's a more structural uh, 
uh, potential for uh, a more structural etiology for the symptoms. Um, Personally, I have not had to do any kind of prophylactic compartment release of the forearms, um, but I have seen it described, um, but it's a, for me at least, I'm not sure if it's something that is seeing me and I'm not seeing it, but typically I will work up patients for more of the standard overuse and strain type injuries before uh, going towards a diagnosis of uh, exertional compartment syndrome. Awesome, thank you. And one more question. Um, regarding treating your patients with carpal tunnel syndrome with injections, if they opt not to have surgery, do you have a, a cutoff of maximum number of injections that we do? Yeah, so this is, uh, you know, hotly debated. Um, you know, you know, as, as I've discussed, cortisone injections are really not risk-free and repeated cortisone injections do affect, um, you know, tenocytes. And when you're injecting into the carpal tunnel, you're injecting all around the, the long flexors. Um, so, Typically, if a patient has, if a patient gets an injection with me and they are a good candidate for surgery, due to the fact that I perform this endoscopically, um, I've had so many patients tell me that the surgery actually is less painful than the injection. Um, and they recover well, and it's a more permanent solution. In terms of number of injections for a cutoff, I don't really have one. Um, but after the first injection, and if they really pull my arm, a second injection, I try not to make this a mainstay of treatment for prolonged periods of time. Um, a cortisone injection is very valuable as it really does give you both diagnostic and therapeutic information. Um, a lot of patients have double crush syndrome, they have diabetic neuropathy, other reasons to have numbness and tingling. And if they have excellent resolution of symptoms with a cortisone injection, that is kind of what they should expect to have with a carpal tunnel release, but more permanently. Um, so to answer your question, I, I typically will only do one, um, but in patients that really have, um, you know, like, like a musician who has upcoming performances or anything like that, um, I can do two to three, but tr really try not to do more than that. Thank you. Thank you, Duke. I think that was a, a great lecture, and I think everybody really um, appreciated it based on the comments in the chat. Perfect. Yeah, I, I apologize. It was so broad. Um, you know, trying to cover MSK injuries in such a heterogene heterogeneous group is pretty tough. Um, and like Dr. Wilkins had mentioned. <laughs> Um, I could even, even include the athlete in this as it's a completely separate group. We'll just bring you back in the spring and have you do the athlete. <laughs> Sounds good. All right. Have a great day, everybody. Yep. Thank you so much. Thanks, everyone.